What is up you guys? So in this one, we're going to give an application on matrix determinants and matrix inverse. So this application is going to be on encryption. So when we say encryption, we mean encrypting or decrypting a certain message, right? So before going into the application, we're going to give a very important result that lies in the essence of one way of encrypting a message. So it has to deal with adjoints and matrix determinants and so on. So we'll start off by a theorem. I'm not aware of the name of the theorem. If you know the name of the theorem, kindly post it down in the comment section below. So the theorem goes as follows. If A is in Z and by N, what is Z? It's the set of integers. And the determinant of A is restricted to plus or minus one, then we can say something about the inverse of A. First of all, it exists. Why? Because the determinant of A is not zero. And second and most importantly, A inverse is also in Z and by N. That said, A inverse is also a matrix with integer entries. Now that's super important. And it is trivial for the particular case n equal 1, right? So for n equal 1, what do we have? a is a scalar, right? An integer scalar. And determinant of a is plus or minus 1. That said, a is either plus or minus 1, right? We've got no other case. So the inverse of a exists, of course, it's not 0. And second of all, the inverse of a is also an integer y 1 over a is 1 over plus or minus 1 that is also plus or minus 1 hence it's also an integer we and more than that and in, in this specific case n equal 1 a is a inverse okay now what happens for the case where n is greater than 1 well we'll have to write down the definition of the inverse of a that is 1 over the debt of a the determinant of a multiplied by the adjoint of a so as a quick revision what is the adjoint of a it is a matrix containing the cofactors of a so actually it is the transpose of the matrix containing the cofactors of a so it takes the following form where each component cij is computed by a suitable sign minus 1 to the power i plus j multiplied by the minor ij that is a determinant right obtained by emitting the ith and jth ith row and jth column of a um what can we say about mij well we saw in previous lectures that mij is a determinant of the n minus 1 by n minus 1 submatrix of a formed by removing its ith row and jth column so if we have a matrix of all integers as such what can you say about all the minors of A? They're also integers. Why? Because they're obtained by simple product and sums of integers. And we all know that if you multiply two integers or add two integers, subtract two integers, the result is also an integer. That said, the minors of a matrix containing integers are also integers. Why do we care? Because... That means the adjoint of A will be also a matrix of all integers. Okay, why do we care about that? Well, using this piece of information, we know that the inverse of A is a matrix in Zn by n divided by the determinant of A. Well, in this particular case, we've got that the determinant of A is either plus or minus 1, and hence you're multiplying with either a plus or minus 1. So if you're multiplying an integer, any entry of the adjoint of a with either a plus or minus one it is also going to be an integer and hence the inverse of a is also a matrix of all integers right and the proof is done so back to the application over here that is on encryption now keep in mind that encryption and decryption is a very big topic and a lot of well-known researchers put a lot of effort in this field um, because of the usefulness of encryption. For example, this is due to the explosion of financial transactions on the internet. 
So I don't know if you already knew that, but Bitcoin uses a lot of encryption while validating a certain transaction. It's not as simple as it seems. So say I want to send someone a Bitcoin. Well, it's not as simple as just sending a simple message, right? There's a lot of, you know, forward, backward exchange of keys and many, many sophisticated stuff going on before sending this Bitcoin. So one way of encrypting a certain message is to use inverse matrices. And when I say inverse, I mean, let me show you what I mean. Um, so let's say I've got Ben over here who is in connection with, let's say his wife, Alice, right? And they frequently exchange messages in the form of matrices. Let's put it that way, because that's what it is. You can form any message, you can stack it in a form of a matrix. So let's say a message is represented by a matrix A. So A is a square matrix representing the message. So Ben and Alice are happy, they're sending messages, they're talking to each other, they're in a long distance relationship, I don't know. <laughs> so they're happy, they're sending messages and each one is understanding the other. Well, one day an eavesdropper that goes by the name of, I don't know, Sophie. She's Curious Sophie, call her Curious Sophie. What Curious Sophie decides to do is, you know, eavesdrop. She found a link between two people, Ben and Alice, and she decided to eavesdrop. Well, Sophie is a human being, and it happens that she can understand the matrices of the form A. So if Ben is sending Alice a matrix A, not only Alice receives A, but also Curious Sophie does. So there's a spy over here. There's an intruder. And this intruder is not in the favor of Ben nor Alice. Well, one time Ben found out that there's a curious person grabbing all the matrices A and knowing what there's the conversations between Ben and Alice are. And Ben decided to take action and to watch my courses. <laughs> and it happened that Ben and Alice um, were watching my previous courses on determinants and inverses and decided to use that knowledge. Well, what did they decide to do? Well, they decided, you know, they said, well, whatever, we'll just sense rectangular matrices. So instead of A, we'll be sending B. So this time a message takes a form N by M and you know, Ben and Alice will exchange B. Sophie could also understand what B is. So Ben didn't do anything innovative over here and nothing useful. Well, Alice came up with an idea that, you know, instead of you sending any matrix of any size, you're going to send me a matrix AB where A, so right now B is the message and A is a certain key. A is a square matrix and it will be representing the so-called key. Why is it a key? Because Ben knows about A and A also happens to have an inverse. So Alice knows about its inverse, A inverse. Okay. Curious Sophie didn't watch my lectures and she doesn't know anything about matrix inverses or determinants or whatsoever. So Sophie will just bluntly take a b and understand it as she wants so a b is also of size n by m so while ben sends an a b a matrix a b curious sophie receives an a b and so does alice but what alice does is take this a b pre-multiplied by an a inverse use the associative property of matrix products that is she knows that a inverse a is the identity I, and hence we'll end up with the desired message B. So knowing A inverse will give you the correct message. Not knowing it, in the case of Curious Sophie, will give you the wrong message AB. So in that case, we have encrypted the message using the matrix A so that the receiving end, that is Alice, will need to know A inverse in order to decrypt the message B. Now keep in mind that whenever an undesired intruder, as is the case of Curious Sophie, finds A, 
let's say curious Sophie watched my lectures and she knows about this fishy inverse matrix, right? Well, what people usually do is they change A frequently, more frequently, so that the sender and receiver both know about this A and make it really hard for any other receiving end. So we should have a mechanical way of, you know, generating simple matrices A, which are both invertible and have simple inverses. Because we know that in practice, the inverse of a matrix involves fractions, which are not easy to, to send electronically. Fractions take a large amount of data. So in case you don't know what I mean, so let's say you want to store an integer one, two, three, up to, I don't know, 64. Okay. So how many bits do you need to represent those numbers? You need eight bits. So two power eight to represent numbers going from one to 64. So you need eight bits. That's it. That's all the memory you need. Whereas if you want to represent fractions, it might go a lot more than that. Why? Because representing 0 0.1235, for example, is not the same as representing what you see in front of you here. This might need way more bits than just eight. So keep in mind that computing matrix inverse is not that straightforward. It's not favorable in practice. So the optimal solution here would be to have both A and its inverse in integer form. And that's where this theorem comes in place. So this theorem will be useful to generate such classes of matrices. So one practical way is to start with an upper triangular matrix with entries that are either plus one or minus one on the diagonal and integer entries. Why do we say that? Because if, let's say, this is my A, let's say N is three for simplicity. So we, you know, plus one over here, minus one over here, plus one over here, zero, zero, zero. And really any integer over here, two, three, four, let's say. Why did we impose this structure? Because we know that the determinant of triangular matrices, whether it's upper or lower, is just the product of its diagonal entries. Well, keeping this piece of information in mind, multiplying either plus or minus ones here on the diagonal will give you a determinant that is either plus or minus one. And throwing in integers over here will preserve A to be found in the set Z n by n, right? That said, the inverse of A will also be in Z n by n, and hence we avoid the computation of, you know, fractions. Now, furthermore, we use elementary row operations to alter the matrix. We do not multiply rows with non-integers, that is, will only be restricted to integers, and adding a multiple of one row to another does not change the value of the determinant. We saw that in the previous lecture, right? And in particular here, if a multiple of a row is subtracted from another row or added, doesn't make any difference, the determinant remains unchanged. Extra information over here are if you flip two rows, the determinant flips sign, and yeah. So let's give an example on what I mean. Consider that we've got a matrix A that we load the diagonal with either plus or minus one as such, impose it to be upper triangular and just throw in some random, you know, integers over here. Let's say two, nine and three. Well, let's do some row operations over here. Let's say in R2, I put in R2 plus R1. That said, the first and third rows remain unchanged, whereas the second row becomes, we start one plus zero is one, two plus minus one is also one, and nine plus three is 12. Do the same thing for the third row, that is instead of R3, plug in R3 plus R1. That said, the first two rows remain unchanged, whereas the last row becomes one, two, and 10. Now do one more operation on the third row, that is instead of R3, put in R3 plus R2. The first two rows are unchanged, 
whereas the last row becomes 2, 3, and 22. Okay? So if you're noticing, we're just doing some random operations. I'll do one more here. So instead of R1, I'll put in R2 plus R3, right? So I'll get, and not just that, I'll multiply this by a minus 2 and add it to R1. What we get is the following. So second and third rows are unchanged. Whereas you can go ahead and verify that the first row becomes minus 5, minus 6, and minus 59, right? Now, since we did a bunch of, you know, scaling and adding, we didn't flip two rows. The determinant of A is the same as the determinant of this last matrix over here. So I'm going to eliminate A from here, this notation A. I don't want it here. I want the last matrix to be A. Well, the determinant of A is also minus 1 as A because according to property 4 over here, if a multiple of a row is subtracted or added from another row, the determinant is unchanged. So the determinant of this first matrix that is minus 1 is the same as this last matrix A that is also minus 1. So a matrix A, we're going to use this matrix as a key. Okay, so we'll take A to be the last matrix. We know that the determinant of this matrix is minus 1, and hence computing the inverse is easy. Why? All I have to do is compute the 1 over determinant is a minus 1, so it's a minus the adjoint of A. You do the math, you arrive at the following. So as you can see, it's a matrix of all integers. And now let's say we've got a message B that will reflect the English message today is a good day. So the message today is a good day will be reflected by matrix B. We're now going to put in the characters of today is a good day, this message M, call it M. We're now going to put the characters of M inside a matrix B. No, we're going to associate each character to a number. We're going to map every character to a number. So an easy way to do that is to associate white spaces. So those by number zero, the number one to A, the number two to B, and so on. So in that way, if we say that, let's say there's a table, so white space, so let's say this is a character, and this is the number associated to the character. So white space is zero, A is one, B is two, and so on. You get the point. So in that case, this message, today is a good day, will be mapped as follows. So T could be minus 10, O could be 8, and so on. Actually, the numbers associated to the characters could be random. So D could be something else, let's say minus 2. They don't have to be in increasing order, okay? I could be 5, S could be 10. We've got a white space here, so 0. A could be 1. 0, G could be 4, O could be 8, so 8 twice over here. D is again minus 2, we use it here. We've got a white space here, 0, D is again minus 2, and a 1 and 13. So if we stack those in a matrix B, how many characters do we have right here? So if we do the math, 1, if we count them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. So 19, we're going to add two more white spaces over here. So 0 and 0. Why is that? So that we make the size 21. That is, 3 could be represented by a 3 by 7 matrix. How? Well, all we have to do is grab consecutive 3 numbers and stack them in a column of B. So B would be minus 10, 8, minus 2, then 1, 13, 0. So we need the size of 3 right here so that it matches the dimension of A, which is 3 by 3. So we do need the dimension 3 over here. We continue with the stacking, 5, 10, 0, then 1, 0, 4, 8, 8, minus 2, 0, minus 2, 1, and 13, double 0, okay? So this is the message that, let's say, Ben wants to send to Alice. So he stacks this, today is a good day, in matrix B. He gets this representation of B, right? Then instead of sending B as such, so that curious Sophie does not understand the message, he will instead send A times B. That is, the A we just 
performed over here using a series of row operations. We'll copy it over here. So it's a minus 5, minus 6, and a minus 59 with 1, 1, 12, and 2, 3, 22. Multiply it with B, that is. You get another 3 by 7 matrix. So you grab every row from here, multiply it with every appropriate column from here. To get the entries of AB, that will turn out to be 120, minus 83, minus 85, minus 241, 30, minus 47, and so on. So the encrypted message will be 120, minus 26, minus 40, then minus 83, 14, 41, and so on. So if, let's say in the worst case, Sophie has the, the this mapping, the character number mapping, she will not be able to decode the message. And even more than that, she might have really large numbers such as 120, minus 241, such that, you know, numbers do not have a matching character, right? So in that case, Sophie will know that there is something fishy going on around here. So you'll know that, oh, Ben and Alice are no longer using the mapping table between characters and numbers that we have over here. So she'll be wondering, hmm, is there any matrix A that is being pre-multiplied? So she will have to try a, a lot of combinations of A to find out a, a suitable A that multiplies an appropriate message B to give her this matrix. And this will take her a lot of time. Let's say she implements a brute force algorithm to figure out products of the form AB to give this message over here. It will take her a lot of time. And in that time, Ben and Alice would have exchanged all the messages they need. So there you go. So that's the worst case scenario. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. We gave an application of determinants and inverses on the so-called encryption topic through this theorem over here. That is, if we have a matrix A, that is a matrix with integer entries such that its determinant is plus or minus one, then the inverse of A is also a matrix with integer entries. Now, why is this useful? Well, first off, Imagine that Ben is sending a message to Alice and instead of sending a matrix B, he sends a matrix AB. Well, Alice will have to compute online an inverse matrix A so as to decode the message AB to matrix B, right? Well, if A was not of this structure, then computing the inverse of A would be very hard. Why is that? We'll be faced with fractions and divisions that in practice take a lot of time. Electronically, this is not recommendable. So this theorem will help generating the inverse of A in a fast way. So by preserving the determinant of A to be either plus or minus one, as we saw here, so we, start, we first start by loading the diagonal with either plus or minus one, so that the determinant is either plus or minus one, and throwing in some random integers on the upper diagonal part and doing some random row operations so that the determinant is also preserved, we can instead use this A and the inverse, which is easily computed, to transmit a desired message, say, today is a good day. Okay, we saw an example on how to send the message. So instead of sending a message that reflects today is a good day, we send a b and then alice will have to decode b by multiplying the received message a b with a inverse so that's it for this lecture i hope you enjoyed it if you have any questions whatsoever kindly leave a comment down in the comment section below and i'll make sure i'll get to it as soon as possible if you found this lecture beneficial please leave a like on the video subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.